Welcome to Notman Notes, our series of short online lectures covering popular topics, rule changes, and trends as it relates to FINRA qualification examinations. I encourage you to use this lecture to supplement your studying or to gain additional insight into certain key topics in the securities industry. You should feel free to fast forward and rewind as you navigate through the program. My name is Brian Marks. I will be guiding you through this online program. If you have any questions about your examination or this rule or would like to discuss study strategy, please do not hesitate to contact me at any time. You have my office phone number, my cell phone, and my email address. As you prepare for your examination, it's important that you stay up to date on the latest changes because FINRA expects that you will know them on the day of your examination. The best way to do so is by subscribing to our YouTube channel and subscribing to our blog. For any rule changes, such as this one, those are detailed on our blog and on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to check those out prior to your examination. We would also very much appreciate if you would like us on Facebook, connect with us on LinkedIn, and follow us on Twitter. This installment of Notman Notes will review the registration statement. Okay, part two of this installment, which will be published uh, sometime after this installment, We'll go through the registration process. So it's enough information we've broken into two lectures. The first, we'll discuss the registration statement. The second, we'll talk about the registration process. When an issuer wants to sell securities for the public, the first thing he needs to do is file a registration statement with the SEC. And depending on the type of issuer, there are a number of different registration forms. An S-1 is what's called a long-form registration statement. That's used generally for an IPO or for any issuer that doesn't qualify for any of these other documents. So that's the default registration statement. An S-3 is a short-form registration statement. It's generally used for what's called a follow-on offering. That's for an existing public company who is looking to raise additional capital. So it's post-IPO. An S-4 is for what's called an exchange offer, such as an M&A deal. or some type of refinancing activity. An S-8 is for securities issued to employee benefit plans. And an S-11 is for REITs. REITs are uh, real estate investment trusts. Real estate investment trusts. A general registration statement will have 32 pieces of required information. I'm going to go through the highlights. Okay, we're really talking about here, by the way, is an S-1. And I've broken it down by category to help you remember this information. So you're going to need lots of information about the issuer, such as a description of the issuer's business. The use of the proceeds. a list of any current legal proceedings. You'll need what's called a capitalization table. That's a list of their outstanding securities, both debt and equity. That's called a capitalization table. What you won't need, though, are financial projections. You never need financial projections in a registration statement. 
Under the next category, under the underwriters, you'll have a list of the underwriters and the compensation being received by the underwriters. You have a list of the underwriters and the compensation being received. Also, you'll have a list of officers, directors, and 10% shareholders. Those are called your corporate insiders. That's an officer, director, or 10% shareholder. Also, for officers and directors, you'll have their addresses, you'll have their salaries, and you'll have their five-year business histories, what they've been up to for the last five years. Their addresses, their salaries, and their five-year business histories. The issuer in its registration statement must also, of course, include financial statements. And these are required under Regulation SX of the Securities Act of 1933. And these are audited financials. The issuer must include balance sheet information for each of the last two years, an income statement and cash flow statements for each of the past three years. So you need two balance sheets, three income statements, and three cash flow statements. Also, those financials must be refiled if they become outdated. And they become outdated after 130 days for what are called Wixies or seasoned issuers. A Wixie is what's called a well-known seasoned issuer. A Wixie is a well-known seasoned issuer or seasoned issuers. And for all other issuers, the financials become outdated if they're more than 135 days old. The distinction between the two is that to be a Wixie or a seasoned issuer, the issuer needs at least a $75 million public float. A $75 million public float. And again, for all other issuers, uh, they, you get an extra five days before you have to refile. Under Section 11 of the Securities Act of 1933, participants in a new issue have liability if there is found to be fraud or misleading information in a registration statement. Okay. And who can be held liable? Well, anybody who participates in the preparation of the filing. Anybody who participates in the preparation of the filing, such as the issuer, senior management of the issuer, attorneys, accountants, and underwriters. Basically, anyone who participates in the preparation of the registration statement can have, ultimate, can have liability. And civil penalties allow an investor to recover okay, the cost of the investment plus interest, so you can be made whole. And the investor can basically get their money back. And how would the investor do so? Well, the investor would have to sue those participants. The investor would have to bring a civil lawsuit against those participants if he or she believes there was fraudulent information in the registration statement. It's possible, though, for a participant to avoid liability by sustaining a burden of proof. So if a participant sustains a burden with, of proof, they can avoid liability. And there are a few ways to do this. The first way is by withdrawing from the transaction and notifying the SEC. So if an underwriter basically tells the SEC, hey, we want you to know we have nothing to do with this deal anymore, obviously that will raise a red flag. It's kind of the idea. The second way a participant can avoid liability is by accessing what's called the due diligence defense. The due diligence defense states that after a reasonable investigation, 
the person believed the information to be true. After a reasonable investigation, the person believed the information to be true. So you did your job, you did your reasonable due diligence, and you were fooled. You did not uncover the fraud. And reasonable here is what's called the prudent man standard. It's called that of the prudent man. That means basically that each underwriter decides when they've done sufficient due diligence. Each underwriter will decide when they've done sufficient due diligence. Also, when the issuer is going through the registration process, uh, they must comply with blue sky laws. Blue sky laws require the issuer and the underwriter the issuer and the underwriter must be appropriately registered in each state where securities are sold. The issuer and the underwriter must be appropriately registered in each state where securities are sold. Okay. Blue sky laws again are state securities laws. Also, gun jumping is a violation. Gun jumping is a violation that occurs when an issuer discusses a transaction before filing a registration statement. If the issuer discusses a transaction before filing a registration statement. So basically, you can't go out and market a deal before you file an S-1 with the SEC. And if you do, that's a gun jumping violation. Uh, there are some ex exceptions to this rule now for what are called emerging growth companies. This is from the Jobs Act. So if a company qualifies as what's called an EGC, an emerging growth company, I'll talk about those in a minute, um, then it can actually what's called test the waters. It can go out and start to talk about a deal if it hasn't yet filed. But other than that, gun jumping is a violation. That concludes this installment of Notman Notes. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. You have my contact information on the second slide. Feel free to repeat and rewind to review concepts. And as always, best of luck on your examination. Thank you.